I'm going to be explaining everything about epoxy edges. I always apply FX Edge Coat to the edge. Now this is not a bonding primer. It's actually a very porous primer meant to allow the epoxy to soak directly through it so the epoxy can still get somewhat of a bond strength to your substrate. What this is for is to block color and if you notice the one behind me, it's completed, this one it's not. So it's very simple. Um, we are pouring on hollow core doors today just for training purposes, but it's very similar in thickness and construction to a countertop. The only difference being is often I construct my countertops out of three quarter inch MDF. So I usually take two sheets of MDF, um, sandwich them together, Sometimes because of limiting factors like an undermount sink and the customer may or may not want a large inch and a half um, profile on the, inch and, on the undermount sink, sometimes I'll actually just make that a false edge on the front. If you notice, I'm just pouring it out and I'm using my surface as my little roller tray. And remember, we're not wanting a bunch of additional product here um, for any purpose other than to block that color and the transition of color over that edge. So. I, I already took a sanding block and I sanded this all um, just to get it really nice and smooth. Then I'm gonna go over this with this, if it, with the primer. If it's not perfect, I'll sand it one more time and apply one more layer of primer to it. This is extremely fast drying and it's really cheap insurance for your jobs. How would I hide a seam? Now often, um, very good question. A lot of you guys wanna know because you build this out of MDF and you sandwich the two sheets. Um, a lot of times right where those two sheets meet, you'll see a little line come through and that generally comes from not adequately sanding, sealing, or using a Bondo or a spackling over that joint. So I usually fill everything, um, if it's really coarse, with spackling or something, if there's actually a seam. But it's really easy. I just apply a nice thin layer, sand it smooth. Don't be like some people sand the entire layer off and they wonder why they have to keep applying it. That is how to prime the edge of a countertop. So as you see, just around the perimeter, I did not do the top surface because I want my epoxy to actually um, bond to this. I'm running this almost like I'm plowing snow. I stop before I get to the end. I see a lot of people, my pet peeve is they push it to the end and they keep pushing excess all off. So I kind of got most of my product to the edge, but before very much of it came over, I stopped. I didn't push the re remainder of it over. That's because now that it's close, I'm gonna come here with my roller and I'm just tacking it up with some wet epoxy on here. And that's breaking the surface tension because see how if you don't break it first, do you see how the epoxy tends to find channels and paths of surface tension that it tries to flow on? Now, even if you were to say push this over and you got it to flow over that edge nicely, what usually happens is you'll see there's, there'll be thicker and thinner spots in there. But as soon as you roll it and break that surface tension, you end up with a really smooth layer that'll flow right off over that edge. Now I've tacked it all up, so now this will be one nice layer and watch this. Do you see how that all lays right directly over this? If at all you touch it lightly, you may go down at one time very lightly, holding all the pressure off of it. Now don't over manipulate it because if I keep rolling it, all I'm doing is actually removing product from that edge. So just leave it be. Watch your corners too. A lot of times I'll try to push a little excess off over my corner. One very important thing with my edges, in my opinion, is that everything we pour starts from off the edge and goes all the way off the opposite edge. So if you notice this right here, I don't think I did a very good job. See how it's all up on top here? That's what makes edges look fake. So let's try to see if we can fix this. I'm just gonna take this and try to continue that band directly off that edge. I'm going to Speckle, just a little bit of gold on this. Now all this is is 99% isopropyl alcohol mixed with some of our pigment. So if you notice, it's a real easy way to apply color. You spritz it on, the alcohol evaporates after melting into the epoxy and leaving a little bit of your color into it. It's really cool. The other kind of neat thing you can do here that I like is some trans green. So trans green gives it a really nice soapstone look 
Um, and once you sand it off, it gives, it's really subdued, but man, it is beautiful. So I think you're gonna like the soapstone look. I hope you can see it on the camera. Um, try to do more of a mist so it's an even pattern, at least on part of it, and play around and speckle some too so you get a little bit of variation, So especially if you're running a sample, so you can see what you like most. The edges, I just merely allow it to flow directly off over that edge. It's very important that whatever you do on the top surface, you do on your edges. Since I sprayed the top, I am going to spray the sides. This is one real easy way that seems like it doesn't really stress people. And I pour it out on the table. Do this on any type of work surface. Maybe the chop effect on this. You can also drip a van directly off your stick if you want something a little more crisp. If you want to let this get hot, pour it out on the table, it'll cool down. It'll solidify when it cools down and give you the opportunity to do a really crisp, sharp, small vein. So, um, so there's a lot of ways. You can also use a brush. A brush tends um, to soak up enough product so it drips off longer, leaves you a better pattern. Well, as I was just showing when I torched here, I tried to stay about an inch away from my edges all the way around as I torched, as I showed you, because the torching, while it self-levels the product and pops air bubbles, it will also self-level it right off the edge. So don't focus right on the edge, torch in the center and let the product do the rest of the work for you. You can apply alcohol to the edge, it's not a big deal either way, really. Just remember that if you have a lot of alcohol and very little color, you'll usually get a dripped effect on your color if you're trying to do it for color purposes prior to it actually applying that color. So if you're trying to get color to stick, make sure you're really concentrated, um, mix it really well, shake it so you spray a little bit of alcohol at a, at a time and you can actually keep it from dripping. Bubbles, if you, tor if you spread it like I showed you, run down at once and torch to the top, you should never have to worry about bubbles. If you ever did, say you set the product was setting up and it was getting really thick, viscosity and hard to work, you could also take a little bit of alcohol, probably two hours into it, dip your finger in it and massage that bubble right out. A lot of times I will come along probably two hours into this, I'm going to take a putty knife, I'm going to scrape off all those drips. Um, while it's still wet, so I don't have to come back and sand them or grind them or route them. You can use a flush cut router, but there's a lot of ways to do it later, but it's so much easier just to take a five in one or a putty knife and get it today. We went ahead and poured our product at about 95 degrees and poured it off over the edge. We did try to keep away from torching the edge, but we torched right near it and we gave the product adequate time to actually settle, um, which pulls the veins over the edge and everything. And now, um, now that the drips have stopped, but the epoxy is still somewhat soft and pliable, I'm gonna take a pretty clean, sharp putty knife and I'm just going to shave along the bottom side of this and cut all those drips right off, so. I try to angle it in just a little bit as I try to turn my knife at somewhat of an angle. Yep, and as you see, that's exactly what you end up with. Um, but you end up with a very clean, much easier process than sanding or routing the edge. I waited about two hours to scrape the drips, but that was mostly due to the timing and the temperature of my pour. So just watch, and as the drips stop dripping, you can start scraping it. You can scrape it multiple times. It doesn't hurt anything, but just stay on it, and pretty soon you'll start noticing there's no more drips coming down. I'm probably gonna come back in five minutes and do this one more time just to make sure that there's nothing still flowing. Often right now, you'll find a one little bubble or a fisheye or something that you just missed in the main coat. But the product, like we said, is still somewhat pliable. Now that we caught it at this time, I can actually take alcohol in my hand and I can actually massage that, use it to lubricate the surface and I could massage a little imperfection, a bubble away, just about anything. If you were to pull your masking as soon as the drips are, were to stop as well, if anything got behind your masking, got on cabinet faces or whatnot, it would give you time to take some alcohol and really gently remove it um, rather than letting it cure the next day, which would make removal much more difficult.
can notice this was probably about five sets of pours. We poured this probably five times and let it drip every time. So the drips on this are much more excessive than you'd ever have to deal with in on an actual job. This one's obviously upside down. You can't just do this on a countertop. You can't just take your kitchen and flip it upside down. This is a variable speed buffer. This is a tool I use in construction a lot. The only reason I use a flapper wheel is it does keep the discs a bit cooler and staying cool keeps it from gumming up is easy um, when you sand these. This does rotate in a clockwise direction. So it is kind of good to turn this at sli a slight angle so that you're trying to push the drips towards on the countertop. And the reason being is sometimes if, if you go the opposite way to where it's peeling out, it has a ten tendency to create flaking or peeling. Can you see how effective that was? Here is the next method, and this is a flush cut bit on a router. So just got a little handheld router, and this actually can work on most kitchens. The only thing is you'll need to have what's called a zero clearance or an offset deck if you want to be able to go all the way up to a wall. Um, this is the same kind of router I often also use, throw it in a tool trailer. It's not like a big table router or something. It makes it really easy to um, cut drips or even make an edge profile while you're fabricating. So basically um, this wheel rides along here, rides along the door. And as long as you keep it really level and you don't move it a bunch, you keep it pretty even, you'll have a really nice fast cut down here. I'm gonna show you a in-home option. This is a oscillating tool. It just vibrates. This blade does have a tendency, it'll try to dive in. So you'll, the only thing with these is you wanna keep this bottom panel here, um, the bottom of the blade, really flat with the countertop. So you can cut this um, so you don't have a really uneven cut. Now, if you notice this, because this blade is not spinning around, it just cuts and then you can just vacuum your dust right up. So this is probably my most preferred method. Now, we're gonna come bring up one other thing. Sometimes you'll be in a situation where maybe you're um, doing a smaller piece and that is the only time maybe where you'll wanna use different tooling. So possibly on this, maybe you're, you don't have a router table or something like that. And that's when you might wanna use just this instead of a router or sand it or whatnot. So just, um, if you're a contractor out there, have a few, few different tools. So you have different um, options available depending on the situation. Like I say, if you're in a house, it's dust free. Um, if you have something, a lot of times the big flapper disc on the grinder, um, I'll actually contour like my chiseled, chiseled edges and whatnot with stuff like that. Um, but Often I think your route your router is really um, common, even a DA sander and this. So a DA sander won't take the drips off initially, but they'll really smooth anything out after you kind of scrape them or whatnot. But always remember, babysit those edges and try to clean them up ahead of time. Mm -hmm.